on March 1st, 1833, Antonio Lopez de Santana became president of Mexico. Texians received the news with considerable enthusiasm. A Federalist, a liberal, and a champion of the Constitution of 1824, he represented their idea of everything a Mexican official should be. They anticipated that the savior of Mexico would receive their petition favorably, especially when such a distinguished envoy presented it. At first, Stephen F. Austin seemed an odd choice. Why did the Wharton faction, so opposed to his patient accommodation, entrust him with such a vital assignment? In the first place, they well knew their own reputation among Mexican politicians. They were more likely to accommodate a man noted for his moderation than anyone tainted by militant associations. Furthermore, Austin spoke Spanish fluently and could articulate the Texian position better than any other. The final reason may have been more Machiavellian in its motives. With the leader of the Peace Party removed from Texas for months, war party agents might take advantage of his absence to agitate, propagandized, and, they hoped, swing public opinion. In an effort to gain at least some Tejano support for the petition, on April 22, 1833, Austin departed San Felipe and booted his trusty mule toward San Antonio de Bear. Once there, only Erasmo Seguin would endorse the document, but pled that personal concerns prevented him from traveling with Austin to Mexico City. Riding to Goliad, Austin could muster even less support from Tejanos there. The impresario dreaded the long and lonely journey. As he explained to his cousin, Mary Austin Holly. I am on the wing for 1,200 miles, on a mule's back, not a pegasus, over plains and mountains, to the city of Montezuma, farther from farm and home than I ever was. His apprehension was justified. From Goliad, Austin rode southward to Matamoros. Once there, he came down with cholera. Although he recovered, Austin was too weak to continue overland. He detested sea travel, but nonetheless booked passage aboard a schooner bound for Veracruz. The winds did not favor the good ship Comet, belying the ship's name, its voyage scheduled for a week, instead required a full month. Austin was seasick the entire time. Once again on dry land at Veracruz, he faced additional obstacles. Centralists had launched a coup against Santana's liberal regime. Consequently, Austin found a war zone between Veracruz and the capital. On July 18th, following 13 days of difficult, sometimes dangerous travel, by stagecoach, Austin finally arrived in the city of Montezuma. Austin discovered that President Santana had abandoned the capital to suppress the rebellion, leaving in his stead Vice President Valentin Gomez Farias. If Santana was a liberal, his vice president was a radical liberal. He led the faction of extremist Federalists called the Puros, who were in the tradition of Vicente Guerrero. Gomez Farias employed his temporary authority to push liberal reforms through Congress. He seemed to go out of his way to alienate members of the army 
and the Roman Catholic Church. He did away with the fueros of the church and army, which had permitted them to stand trial in their own courts. He secularized education, heretofore the exclusive province of the clergy. If that were not enough, he also attempted to challenge the church's economic domination. The acting president's extremism outraged many segments of Mexican society, but it suited Austin's purposes. He reported that Gomez Farias had given him a kind and friendly reception. Yet, in Austin's dealings with Mexican officials, it was always one step forward and two steps back. Initially, he made considerable headway, but then his applications encountered resistance in the Mexican Congress. Worse still, a cholera epidemic in the city brought all business to a standstill. The infection that had stricken him earlier in Matamoros now returned with a vengeance. This time, Austin almost died. He learned that the disease had also ravaged Texas, taking several of his dearest friends and family. Feeling abandoned and alone, Austin succumbed to a bout of depression. His near-death experience weakened him in both body and spirit. Normally, Austin was the most prudent of men, but on October 2nd, he behaved in a most irresponsible manner. Writing to the Bayer Ajuntamiento, he gave his frustration full vent. The happening of the Civil War has frustrated all the public business, so that until now, nothing has been done, and in my opinion, nothing will be done. Therefore, I hope that you will not lose one moment in sending a communication to all the ajuntamientos of Texas, urging them unite in a measure to organize a local government independent of Coahuila, even though the general government withholds its consent. In his distressed state of mind, Austin may not have realized the implications of his letter. By pressing the Tejanos and Texians to act in defiance of the central government, he had committed sedition. Soon after Austin fired off that incendiary missive, his fortunes took a positive turn. President Santana returned to Mexico City, resumed his duties, and took two meetings with the impresario. Those meetings went extremely well. Earlier, the Mexican Congress had voted to repeal Article 11 of the Law of April 6, 1830, the clause that prohibited further immigration into Texas from the United States. Santana approved the retraction, but stipulated that its implementation would occur in six months. Austin found the president obliging. Writing to his brother-in-law, he gushed. He speaks very friendly about Texas. I am of the opinion that if you all keep quiet and obey the state laws, that the substance of all Texas wants will be granted. The appearance of things is much better than it was a month or even two weeks ago. By the end of November, Austin had spent four months in the capital. During that time, he had achieved much. Mexican officials had reestablished the impresario system. They also seemed amenable to judicial reform and tariff relief. While Santana and Gomez Farias had given Austin a respectful hearing, they and the Mexican Congress still seemed unwilling to separate Texas from Coahuila. Austin understood, however, that it had always been unlikely, at least in the short term. He had accomplished all that he could in Mexico City. On November 26th, he wrote his friend and business partner, Samuel May Williams. 
Texas matters are all right. Nothing is wanted but quiet. It is now very important to harmonize with Bayer. Keep this in view. I shall be home soon. Such predictions were to prove unduly optimistic.